Hello, here I am again in the name of the Sovereign Creator of Heaven and Earth, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm continuing my exposition of my translation of Acts, based on Family 35 Greek text. We're in chapter 13. We come to verse 16. Paul and Barnabas are in Antioch, or Pisidian Antioch. And Paul, Paul is just now going to start his message. I'm going to read verses 16 through 25. So standing up and motioning with his hand, Paul said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people chose our fathers and prospered the people during their sojourn in the land of Egypt and brought them out of it with an uplifted arm. For a period of about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, <coughs> he gave them possession of their land. After these things, he gave judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, a son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for forty years. And removing him, he raised up for them David as king, about whom he gave witness and said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. God, from this man's seed, according to promise, has brought salvation to Israel. John, having heralded beforehand in advance of his coming a baptism of repentance to Israel. Well, as John was fulfilling his course, he said, Whom do you suppose me to be? No, I am not. But indeed, he comes after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Paul is going to carry on for a while, but let's just stop and pick up a few items here. The first thing I want to comment is on is verse 20. It says, he gave judges for about 450 years until Samuel. Well, if you take all the events recorded in the book of Judges, Plus Eli's 40 years, you get exactly 450 years. Because after Eli, of course, Samuel took over. So that's precisely correct. It was 450 years until Samuel, the prophet. Along with his other functions, Samuel was a prophet. That wasn't all that he was, but the text here says he was a prophet. Saul reigned for 40 years. That was a considerable period of time. Matter of fact, David also reigned for 40 years. In verse 23, I need to comment a couple little things. They're just uh, minor differences in the, in, the, in the Greek text. Doesn't really make much difference, but instead of brought... 25% more or less of the Greek manuscripts have raised up, as you have in the AV and the NKJV. doesn't make much difference. Instead of salvation, here we do have a bit of difference. Instead of salvation, some 15% of the Greek manuscripts have a Savior, Jesus, and you'll see that in most versions. But as a matter of fact, 85% of the Greek manuscripts, including the best line of transmission, have salvation to Israel. A baptism of repentance to Israel. Again, 20% of the manuscripts have all the people of Israel. Doesn't make much difference. Now, verse 25. John obviously is giving an answer in advance to a speculation that was going around. The people were wondering whether he might not be the Messiah. And so that's when he says, who do you think I am? No, I'm not. That is to say, you're thinking that I'm the Messiah. No, I am not. 
but indeed he comes after me. The sandals of whose feet I'm not worthy to untie. Okay, let's go on. Verse 26 through 31. Men, brothers, sons of the stock of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. The Jerusalem dwellers and their rulers, understanding neither him nor the voices of the prophets that are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. Though they found no cause for death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had fulfilled all things that were written about him, they took him down from the cross and placed him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he was seen by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. Going back to verse 26. Brothers, sons of the son, that's the Jews. But when he says, those among you who fear God, those are proselytes. Those would be Gentiles who had converted, so to say, to the Jewish religion, and therefore they were in the synagogue. Instead of to you, perhaps 4% of the Greek manuscripts have to us, as in most modern versions. But that's not what the text says. The text says to you. The word of this salvation has been sent. Has been sent. Sent by whom? Or <laughs> using whom? Well, through exactly Paul and Barnabas. They were now the messengers bringing the word of this salvation. And he goes on to say that the, the rulers there in Jerusalem and so on, they did not understand Jesus nor the voices of the prophets, but <clears throat> they fulfilled what the prophets said by condemning him. They had to go to Pilate to ask to have him executed because Jews could not crucify, and the Old Testament says that he would be crucified. So uh, even in that, they had to go to Pilate to ask permission. They were merely fulfilling prophecy, whether they knew it or not. That's what it says in verse, 30, verse 29. They fulfilled all things that were written about it. And of course, it was Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus that took him down from the cross and placed him in the tomb. Actually, when I read here, down from the cross, in the Greek text, it's tree. You get that sort of like a euphemism. A tree standing for the cross. God raised him from the dead. Many days he was seen by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are, notice that the verses in the present tense, who are his witnesses to the people. I take it that Paul is saying that evidently some, at least, if not most, of the original apostles were still alive. We know that some of them had already been killed, but probably most of them were still alive. That's why he says they are his witnesses to the people. I'm going to continue now, verses 32 through 41, which will finish Paul's message. Yes, we proclaim to you the good news, the promise that was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled the same to us, their children. When he raised up Jesus, as also it stands written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And that he was raised from the dead, no longer to return to corruption, he has spoken thus, quote, I will give you the holy things guaranteed to David, end quote, Further, it is stated elsewhere, quote, you will not allow your Holy One to see decay, end quote. Now, David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and saw decay. But the one whom God raised up did not see decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, men, brothers, that through this one forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from everything you could not be justified from by the law of Moses. So take care, lest there come upon you that which, was, that which has been spoken in the prophets. 
Look, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I am working a work in your days to which you will not give credence, even if someone were to explain it in detail to you. And that is the end of Paul's message. Verse 33. When he raised up Jesus. That may not be what is in your Bible. The point is that this is not talking about the resurrection from the dead. This is talking about the incarnation. The resurrection comes in verse 34. So I translated deliberately raised up Jesus because this is talking about the incarnation. Jesus this is not talking about the resurrection from the dead. It comes in verse 34. Why? Because notice what it says at the second half of verse 33. As it stands written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. That's Psalm chapter 2, verse, or second psalm, verse 7. This day I have begotten you. That's talking about the incarnation. Okay? That's not talking about the death and resurrection. This day I have begotten you. That's the incarnation. So, that's how come I translated it that way in verse 33. Now verse 34, and that he raised him from the dead. You stop to remember that the resurrection is crucial. Without the resurrection, we do not have a gospel. Paul makes that very clear in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. Always, always the apostles emphasize the resurrection. You remember that when Peter said they had to elect someone to replace the Iscariot, it had to be someone who can bear witness with us to the resurrection. That's the crucial point. Now he goes on, no longer to return to corruption. Now this is interesting. People like Lazarus and others that Jesus brought back from the dead, but the poor things, they had to die all over again. <laughs> and Lazarus went back to the tomb, and there he certainly did see corruption. But that did not happen to Jesus because Jesus was the resurrected. It was not just uh, an interrupting the death as happened with Lazarus and so on. Resurrection means that the body is reunited with the spirit. In our case, it's a glorified body, and also, obviously, the case of the Lord. No longer to return to corruption. That's going to be our show as well. That's going to be a good day. Thank you. No longer to return to corruption. Amen. Okay. I have to confess that I don't understand very well uh, the first quote here at the end of verse 34. Verse, the first quote is from Isaiah 55, verse 3. I will give you the holy things guaranteed to David. I'm just really not sure about that. Except, of course... If Jesus remained dead in the tomb, he couldn't receive anything. So for him to receive the holy things guaranteed to David, indeed to receive anything else, he had to be alive. Maybe that's the point. When we really get to it is verse 35. This has been used before. Peter used it. I believe the Lord himself used it, as a matter of fact. Quoting Psalm 16, verse 10, You will not allow your holy one to see decay or corruption as you choose. That happened literally. There was no bad smell in the sepulcher where Jesus was buried. No bad smell, at all, but there was no decay, no, no decay, no corruption there. But there was with David. You may, you may recall that Peter on the day of Pentecost, he's preaching and he uses this text and he actually says that <laughs> David's tomb was still among them. They still knew which tomb was David's in his day, Peter's day. That was a thousand years after David was buried. Apparently, in that time, uh, his tomb was still known. But obviously, David saw decay. Which, of course, means that that particular text, Psalm 1610, could not refer to David. Because he saw decay. So here, that text is talking about someone else. You will not allow your Holy One. So the Holy One is precisely the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
the one whom God, whom God raised up, verse 37, did not see decay. Obviously, this involves supernatural intervention. So now he gets down to the point. Through him, Jesus, forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you. And now he, now he rings the changes on the difference between the gospel of Christ and the Old Testament law. He says, by him, anyone who believes, you believe into Jesus, you can be justified from things which the law of Moses could not handle. You could not be justified from by the law of Moses. The law as a means of justification was sadly deficient. The resurrected Jesus is marvelously efficient. So now, Paul ends with a warning. Look, you despisers, marvel and perish. I am working and working your days which you will not, to which you will not give credence, even if someone were to explain it in detail to you. You can see this in Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 5. You know, and according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, those who reject the love of the truth, God himself sends an act of delusion to them so that they will believe the lie. That's in the text. That's why God does it. So they will believe the lie. It follows, I think, that despisers, those who have rejected the truth, are rendered incapable of understanding the, the explanation. That's what it says here. You will not give credence even if someone were to explain it in detail to you. Like you, you become simply incapable to understand. That's what I get out of it. So, now we come to the reaction. Now, verses 42 through 45 to begin. Now, as the Jews were going out of the synagogue, the Gentiles implored repeatedly that these words might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. The synagogue service having been dismissed, many of the Jews and the devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who started addressing them, urging them to continue in the grace of God. Well, the next Sabbath, almost the whole city was gathered to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with envy and started speaking against the things said by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. In verse 42, there is a set of textual variants. There's a sort of like a bad three-way split. But I won't trouble you with the explanation because it doesn't really make any difference. If you want the explanation, you can find it in the in the footnote to my translation, you can either have it here or you can download it from my site, Crunch or I won't bother you now because it doesn't really make much difference. The proselytes, the, the Gentiles who have become uh, converted to Judaism, Judaism, they're told their friends all about it, and so everyone wanted to hear this. So they agreed to come together the next day. But in the meantime, those that really had already believed stayed with Paul and Barnabas, and they had a whole week. So Paul and Barnabas were teaching the ones that had already believed and already had come along, urging them to continue in the grace of God. But the next Sabbath, just about the whole city came out. Well, you know, <laughs> this didn't sit well with the Jews. They were filled with envy. Human nature is still what it has always been. Human nature isn't all that good. So they started contradicting and blaspheming and so on. About 20% of the Greek manuscripts omit contradicting, and as you'll find in most modern versions, don't let it trouble you. What the text says is contradicting and blaspheming. Let's go on now. Verses 46 through 48. But Paul and Barnabas, speaking boldly, said, It was necessary that God's word should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, now we are being turned to the Gentiles, because that is just how the Lord has commanded us. I have set you to be a light for ethnic nations, that you should be for salvation up to the last place on earth. 
Now upon hearing this, the Gentiles rejoiced and glorified the Lord, the word of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. Notice what the apostles say, Paul and Barnabas. It was necessary that God's word should be spoken to you first. It appears that the apostles had a clear conviction that Jews should have the first chance. You notice this over and over again. Whenever there was a synagogue, they always went there first. However, he says, since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, <laughs> I think he's being a little bit sarcastic there. Yeah, yeah. So if you don't want eternal life, it's your problem. <laughs> now, and there's emphasis on the now, now we are being turned to the Gentiles. We are being turned. That's passive voice. An outside force is turning them. And that outside force, of course, is God himself because they go on saying, that is just how the Lord has commanded us. <clears throat> and now he cites Isaiah 49, 6. I have set you to be a light for ethnic nations that you should be for salvation up to the last place on earth. Isaiah 49, 6. Now you go back there, you will see that the prophecy refers to the Messiah. What? Paul and Barnabas are representing him. Paul and Barnabas are representing the Messiah. And therefore, they feel that they can appropriate, if you will, <laughs> that prophecy. God himself is turning them now to the Gentiles. And so, of course, the Gentiles were very happy. Verse 48, they glorified the word of the Lord. Notice how it ends, though, here. Verse 48 says, As many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. So here we have God's sovereignty and human responsibility placed side by side. God appoints. We have to believe. There's God's side and there's our side. Okay, let's read 49 through 52, and that will finish chapter 13. Well, the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city and raised up a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their borders. So they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. But the disciples were filled with joy and with Holy Spirit. When it says here in verse 49 that the word of the Lord spread throughout all the region, I take that to mean that a fair number of local congregations must have sprung up because people didn't have cars back then. You had to have local congregations. People just couldn't travel that far for a service. Now, once the women get involved, you better watch out. <laughs> They stirred up the devout and prominent women, and so on. I want to comment, though, on what it says here in verse 51. They shook off the dust from their feet against them. Now, in doing that, they were following an instruction given by the Lord himself. That's in Matthew chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, also Luke 9, verse 5, and something that Jesus himself illustrated by example in Matthew 11, verses 23 and 24, there Jesus merely spoke the curse. He didn't have to shake the dust off his feet. However, I believe that history records that Pisidian Antioch entered into decline at precisely that point. Up to that moment, Pisidian Antioch was growing, it was prospering, it was growing in importance, but from that day on, for some reason, all of a sudden, of course, your, or, your ordinary historians won't be able to explain why it was, but all of a sudden, the growth, the prosperity, the importance started going downhill. And never again did the city in Antioch move forward as it was doing and could have done, because 
the apostles shook off the dust from their feet. Now, I want to tell you that that works today. I have done it, and it is not nice. That is, the results are not nice. You should never do it without very good reason, because it works today yet if you shake off the dust of your feet. And of course, the disciples were filled with joy and Holy Spirit. The apostles went their way, but they left life and joy behind. Hey, that's great, you know. That should be true of us too. Whenever we go somewhere, we should leave joy and life behind if we move on, or when we move on. 